I've had what I thought was the best job in the United States Navy the past two years. I was the ship's first lieutenant, so second in command. And I got that job. I was very excited because I got to come home again uh, from Dedham, Massachusetts. My wife was here in Holliston when I took a job to San Diego to be an engineer to make sure that I got promoted, and that was a great job being on a big gray ship. So I got the job to come back to be on not only a Boston, Massachusetts ship, but the iconic old Ironsides. So I thought I was the luckiest person in the world. Since then, I screened for command, and since then I've been assigned as the next commanding officer of USS Constitution. So on the 29th of this month, one week from today, I will be sworn in. I get my second epaulette here on the right shoulder, which I've been waiting a long time for, and I'm really excited for it. You do have to pinch me. I almost feel guilty sometimes about the job that I have because there are thousands of sailors that are still on gray ships throughout the world, Marines still fighting, and I do my best to represent them to large groups, small groups, and anyone that comes onto the ship. We did almost 600,000 visitors to Old Ironsides in 2019 alone. So I take this job, even though it's a plum job and a fun job, I take it very seriously for what I've been asked to do. And, and it is a pleasure to be here with everybody today. So thank you for having me. All right. So I, I give this brief a lot. And I kept asking because I couldn't find my phone. I asked someone if I could borrow a phone that I could keep looking at time because I could talk for two or three hours right now about old Ironside's history, 222 years old. But it's such a beautiful day. I'm going to keep it to 40 and then open up to questions. And please feel, feel free that if you have a question, we don't need to wait till the end. Just go on and raise your hand and yell it out, and that'll be fine uh, if something's on your mind. So the United States Navy, we're working th towards 300 and plus gray ships, but we keep one of these old sailing ships in the arsenal, and that is USS Constitution, and do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, but first, what is USS Constitution? If you could raise your hands, who is familiar with USS Constitution, has heard of her? Everybody's heard of her. Okay, excellent. Uh, who has been to USS Constitution? That's good. Who's been in the last two years? That's pretty good numbers, too. All right, excellent. You'd be surprised, or I'm still surprised, how many people in Massachusetts have never been to the ship. Uh, so I'd like to encourage everyone. This is America's ship of state, but she's a Boston girl, born and raised right there in the North End, now living in Charlestown for, for quite a long time. Uh, and I encourage everyone to come back and see her. She's in the best shape of her 222 years. Why is she special? She is one of the first original six frigates, and I'll get into uh, why George Washington commissioned those first original six frigates. But, but she is the oldest commissioned warship afloat. Afloat is very important to me. She is in the water. She is absolutely capable of sailing. She sailed in 2012. She sailed in 1997. The last time before that was 1881. But that's an important distinction because you may have heard of a ship called HMS Victory. Has anyone heard of Victory? Lord Nelson's flagship, which is still in Portsmouth, New England, still in great shape, a beautiful ship. However, she is in permanent dry dock, and I think that's pretty uncool, and that makes us way better. <laughs> However, they still claim to be commissioned, so we have to add that afloat part at the end. What does it mean to be commissioned? Truthfully, we aren't going anywhere anytime soon. There's still conflicts going all around the world. We're not going to be participating in them at all, but we do have an active duty crew, and that's what makes us commissioned. I have active duty service still in 19 years this May. Uh, and uh, proud to serve the 85 sailors that work with me are all active duty. This is considered special surety. So two years out of your career, you come off the gray ship, you come out of the Riverine Squadron, uh, and you serve on Old Ironsides, and you get to tell her story, and then it's right back to the fleet with you, uh, which could be my path. We'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, back one, please. Sorry. Uh, oldest, like I said, launched in 1797, 222 years old, and, and she is a warship. 44 gun frigate, and I'll talk about the guns in a little bit. She's birthed at the Charlestown Navy Yard. She wasn't, uh, she wasn't uh, built there. She was built at Edmund Hart Shipyard, a private shipyard, which is right across the water from the Charlestown Navy Yard, uh, which is now, if you're familiar with the North End, where the U.S. Coast Guard Base Boston is. That's where she was built and launched from. Took three times to get her in the water. They didn't realize how heavy she was going to be with the use of live oak, uh, so it took three times. The first time, President Adams was there. The second time, decided not to show up, smart move, and the third time, it happened at midnight, so they fired a gun from the top of uh, Bunker Hill to signify that it had launched. There was absolutely no one in the crowd to see it go into the water, <laughs> third time, but that's all right. Uh, why else is she still around? Well, 
Her legacy says that she merits that, the pride and respect of the United States of America, because she is undefeated, victorious, perfect. 33 naval victories, never been defeated. There's been some close calls, and I'm going to talk about one of them, the War of 1812, Battle vs. Java, which we probably should have lost, but we didn't. Uh, so that's significant. We represent uh, maritime excellence, and that's an important thing for our sailors and current commanding officer out at sea, that we maintain that maritime superiority currently. And America's ship of state. So we are uh, deemed by President Obama to be the president's flagship, which is a new distinction. And with that comes uh, some special duties as well, it's something we have a lot of pride in. Next slide, please. So why do we keep a 222-year-old ship in the arsenal? I have a mission, and my mission from the Chief of Naval Operations directly, that's who I work for, and the Director of Navy Staff, uh, is to preserve, protect, and promote not only USS Constitution and the story of old Ironsides, but all of the United States Navy and all of the armed forces. So absolutely the United States Marine Corps, hoorah for the Marines. Can I raise a hand of any veterans in the group as well? Thank you for your service, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, but also all the services. So we do things with the United States Army, the United States Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, all the time. And also we are to be the Navy's physical embodiment of the Navy's heritage and a symbol of inspiration for all of our active duty veterans. We're a pretty good recruiting tool. If you come aboard our ship and talk to one of my sailors for 30 minutes, you're going to be fired up. And I'll get the enlistment papers off my desk and I'll give it to you right now. It's good to see some young, dumb future sailors in the audience. Excellent. I've got the papers in the car. I'll sign you up right now. But that, that, that is why I'm here, why the Navy spends the money, the millions of dollars, to keep a 220-year-old ship in place and to pay for the activity sailors to man her. Next, please. Okay. Now, I could choose many topics to talk about, but what she is most famous for is her battles in the War of 1812. Okay? And I'm going to lead you right to it. A lot of people, especially tourists, and people just, just don't know, and it's easy to uh, make the mistake that this ship was part of the Revolutionary War. She was not. She was not commissioned until the Revolutionary War was over. George Washington had a Navy, a Continental Navy, so we like to make the dis distinction between Continental Navy and then United States Navy. We were the first of the six United States Navy frigates. But the Continental Navy served its purpose. We beat the British in the Revolutionary War. And what do we say? Oh, we don't need a Navy anymore. It's too expensive to man, too expensive to maintain these ships. So they sold them off. And they disbanded the United, uh, excuse me, the Continental Militias as well. Uh, so up to that point, the Navy was over. Next, please. But the United States merchant fleet was growing and growing and growing exponentially and they needed to be protected. They were ripe for piracy, and they were ripe for uh, the Tunis, Tripoli, Algiers, and Morocco Barbary Corsairs to board them, take all our goods, and force us to spend all that money uh, paying them off or, or reshipping all of these goods. So it was very costly that we didn't have a Navy. So George Washington finally did the benefit analysis and said, okay, we, we're going to need a Navy to protect our own. What we had been doing is we were just paying tributes and ransoms to the Tripolitan states to make sure that they left us alone. And guess what? They didn't. They took our money and they boarded us anyway. Next, please. The War of 1812, I am biased, as I talk about the War of 1812 all the time, does not get the, the respect and credit that it deserves for setting us off on the path of becoming the greatest nation in the world in history, in my humble opinion. So I consider, and the historians that I work with, I'm not a historian, like you said, I'm a mechanical engineer, call it the, the second war for independence. And it really was. It really was the second round, part two. We had not been, get, had not got the respect of the French. We had not got the respect of the uh, British government, particularly with trade. And, and we really needed to step and stand up on our own. So Constitution, by the War of 1812, had been launched. She had served in, in, in the quasi-war conflict with France and, and achieved some victories there. That conflict was based on the fact that we did not support their revolution, even though we promised we would at the end of our revolution, so they were not too happy about that. It never, it never escalated to full conflict. That's where that quasi-war uh, comes in. We finally did go to war 
with the Barbary Corsairs and the Tripolitan States in the early 1800s, 1804 to 1805, of which Constitution was a major part of, and I'll come back to that, Captain Edward Preble, Captain William Brambridge, some of the names you might be familiar with were critical in that engagement. And finally, the, the slogan down here, free trade and sailors' rights. I'm going to sit on that for a second. So during the War of 1812, France and Britain are having their own conflict. We wanted to maintain neutrality. We wanted out of it. We were a growing nation. We were a growing military. We weren't really ready to take on these other two forces. We didn't want to get involved. They can have their war. As long as our economy is growing, as long as our commerce is growing and our ships can sail, we'll be fine. Well, they did not accept that. Either of the country didn't accept that, France or Great Britain. Napoleon instituted these things called Napoleonic Decrees that said that any ship that was trading with Great Britain was not neutral and could be boarded. Britain turns around and signed the Orders in Council that said any ship or any country that was trading with France could be boarded because they were no longer neutral. So obviously we're stuck in the middle and that's not a very comfortable place to be. So free trade and sailors' rights was the rallying cry during the War of 1812 as, as the United States citizens were pushing President James Madison towards conflict to end these orders in council. Sailors' rights uh, was even more important to me. Now, the British Navy had 1,800 to 1,000 ships. The new United States Navy had six, six original frigates. Uh, of which Constitution is one. Chesapeake, uh, Constellation, Congress, President, and uh, the United States. There actually are some benefits, a lot of benefits, to having a small Navy versus having a thousand ship Navy. One of those is manning those ships. To man a thousand ships is very costly. Okay? Uh, to the, the ships that uh, were out at sea had poor food, had poor uh, enlistment rules. If I was in the, a British service and I enlisted for two years and then at the end of that two years I wanted to get out, the British Admiralty could say, no, you're going back in to the British service. Long story short, British sailors were defecting in droves from the British Navy during the 1812 period. Okay? And where were they going? If I'm a sailor and I have all these skills, I'm going to go where the money's good and that's the United States Maritime Fleet or I'm going to go into the new United States Navy fleet. British, Britain was very unhappy with that. They would board American ships and grab British sailors, defectors, off the ship back into British service. They got so bold that they would board American ships and say, you look British, <laughs> I'm American. Nope, you're British today, and pull them into service in a, pro in a process that we call impressments which essentially was slavery. And that's really the personal aspect of this that got us into the war. President James Madison said, we finally have to go to war because there were a lot of people, especially in the Northeast, that, that wanted to stay out of the War of 1812, did not want armed conflict with Great Britain. We had valid reasons to, but what if we lost? Who wants to go back to the way it was? So there was a lot of trepidation for the War of 1812, but really, it had to be done, in my humble opinion. Next, please. So now we're at war at Great Britain, and I'll just say that I focus on the war in the Atlantic. The War of 1812 was, was, was all over to the north as we were fighting to, to decipher where the northern Canadian border would be. Uh, the, the British landed in, in Virginia and, and raised the White House, as you probably know, and also all the way to the south. Uh, General Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans came later, but uh, I focus on the war in the Atlantic, which... Truth be told, probably strategically was, or operationally, excuse me, wasn't that important as some of the land battles, but strategically it was critical. This over here on the left is Captain Isaac Hull. I do not uh, think that I am on the same level of Captain Isaac Hull, but I will say we share one common piece of trivia. He was the ship's first lieutenant before he moved up to be commanding officer. I am the second in the 222-year period that we will do that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Proud of that fact. Uh, and like uh, Captain Isaac Hull, you know, my career has had some ups and downs, and I have learned to persevere and try, try again to get me to where I am. And uh, that is what happened to Captain Isaac Hull here. Has anyone heard of the Great Chase before? 
So Captain Isaac Hull, taking command of USS Constitution, heads out to sea with orders that say, pick a fight. All right, let's get it on. Excellent. So he goes out to sea. He's off the coast of Canada, Nova Scotia, and he's looking for a British warship to take on. He's got the, the, the best ship in the world, Old Ironsides. Should be able to beat any uh, ship of the same class, a frigate, because we're considered a heavy frigate. I'll get into the design in a little bit. Uh, but also fast enough to outrun a ship of the line, which is a two-cover gun deck, which rates about 84 guns. Constitution rates about 44 guns. So she's off the coast of Nova Scotia looking for a fight. She sees a ship in the distance and takes off chaser. Sees a British flag. Excellent. Go get her. All of a sudden, though, he sees four more shadows and, uh-oh, four more British flags. Now, Captain Isaac Hull, one of the greatest captains in history, one-on-one, -on -one, I'm putting my money on him, five-on-one, -on -one, I don't think so. No shame in what he did next. We like to say attack, tactical retreat. He took off and ran away. Excellent. Smart move. However, one little problem. Ships need something to move. Wind. And just as he turned around to take off, the wind died. But luckily for him, all five ships also needed wind to chase them down. So really, it was five ships staring at one ship for the next 57 hours to get away. Now, we like to joke that it was the, the uh, slow motion, molasses, getaway event. However, the sailors on Constitution were fighting for their lives. Uh, if they were caught, the ship probably would have been destroyed. It would have been a, a, a five-year history, vice a 22-year history. And also his reputation was on the line. How do you get a ship to move when there's no wind? You can try a couple things. Nothing really works. You can douse the sails with water, try to catch just a little bit of wind. You're throwing all the excess weight overboard. The water, the food, the shells, you're not gonna, or the balls you're not going to use. Overboard, trying to lighten the ship just to get away just a little bit. They launched their small boats. They put sailors in the water to row away. And the British did exactly the same thing. They were mimicking every move that we made. Uh, and finally, we, we, uh, we started kedging. If you're not familiar with kedging, a ship of constitution size would have several different types of anchors. Kedgings would be one of the smaller anchors. You literally tie an anchor to the small boat, row it out ahead of the ship, drop the anchor, and then pull yourself onto it. And you repeat this over and over and over again. For 57 straight hours, the crew of USS Constitution kedged to exhaustion. Finally, after 57 hours, was able to get away enough into a rain squall and lost the other five ships. Extremely lucky uh, and, and that uh, they were able to get away. But it goes to show you that the, the character of the sailors, the character of Isaac Hull, who could have easily given up, but he did not and lived to fight another day. Next, please. What was the range for the British ship? About five miles. About five miles. Um, redemption. I'm going to come back to that a, little bit, a couple times. So he goes back to port, tells everyone the story. Uh, I don't think it's embarrassing. He felt it was pretty embarrassing. But it's time to regroup, get back in the sea, resupply, put more water back in the ship. And guess what? Here's your orders. Find a British warship and, and, and pick a fight. So we went back out, and luckily, off the coast of Nova Scotia again, he sees a ship in the distance. He's a little, a little worried. He sees one. Okay, he sees a British flag. He's good. Waits a little while. Doesn't see four more. Now it's really on. Luckily for him, one of those ships just happened to be the Guerrier, which was part of the group of the original five. Oh. Yes. This was an even fight. Guerrier was a little bit smaller, about a 38-gun frigate. Constitution's a 44-gun frigate. They raised their battle ensign, we raised ours, and we made our slow approach. This battle, in total, only lasted about 20 minutes. It took hours, obviously, to get ready, uh, to get the uh, gunpowder in place, the guns in place. And then, really, as you can see, I won't go through the, the, the tactics here, in those days, there are only really a couple maneuvers. You get up close, and then you fire everything you got at them. Okay, And that's what we did. They waited until, Isaac Hull waited until the Guerriere was only 25 yards away from the other ship. The guns on board Constitution fire, and please come up afterwards and check out what a 32-pound cannonball looks like and a 24-pound ball looks like. 
This looks like a bowling ball. This looks like a candle pin ball. Uh, that coming at you at 200 miles an hour at 25 yards is going to do some damage to you. Okay. Uh, but after that's called new, we're only going to get a couple chances to do this, so wait until they're 25 yards. And they did. They fired a rolling broadside, which means you'd fire the first gun all the way to the end. Boom, 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 boom. In succession, if you fired all at one time, you probably would do damage to your own ship, so that's why they waited. They fired back at us. Smoke, noise, chaos, people are deaf. Splinters, people are dying, blood, death, destruction, absolutely chaotic. Smoke starts to clear. Okay, Isaac Hull asks for a battle damage of his own ship. The carpenter's mate looks over the side, sees that cannonballs have stuck into the hull on the side of the ship. The carpenter swears to Isaac Hull that he saw cannonballs hit the side of the ship and fall harmlessly into the water. He looked at Captain Isaac Hull behind the wheel and said, Captain, huzzah! It's as if her sides are made of iron! To which Isaac Hull replied, Iron sides I. From there, the crew called themselves Iron Sides. One more pass with uh, Guerriere, where we did a crossing of the T maneuver, and then the ships collided. Her main mast came over. Game over. Victory for USS Constitution. Now, the significance of this battle cannot be overstated. Okay? We had not proven ourselves to Great Britain that we had mariner skills and seamanship skills and tactical skills that could compare to the great captains of the British Navy until this day, until Isaac Hull uh, proved that we could take on and beat a British warship. This scared the British Admiralty. And the story of this ship called Constitution taking on Guerriere spread like wildfire through the new United States, across the Atlantic, and into Great Britain. That we were a force to be reckoned with. This, this little United States Navy was, was coming around. That was the first Battle of the War of 1812. I talk about ship restoration a little bit at the end. Um, you can imagine that after every battle, all the repairs that would need to be done, the ship crew would bring a lot of wood and a lot of material on board the ship that they could repair at sea that would help them get back into port. If the Guerriere was salvageable, they would have tried to salvage her and then used her under, her, uh, under our flag. Uh, but the ship needed to go back into repairs. When she was back in Boston getting repaired, a change of command happened, and this gentleman right here, Captain William Braybridge, took over. Redemption is a the theme that I, I'll, I'll be harping on a couple times, and he has what I think the greatest redemption story. Uh, he was not a well-liked captain. When I talked about the, the Barbary Wars. We're going to jump back to 1804. USS Constitution was in the Mediterranean, in the north of Africa, fighting those Tripolitan states. Edward Preble was the captain of the ship, Constitution. But he was also the commodore of all the American ships in the Mediterranean as we were bombing the heck out of those Tripolitans. William Bainbridge was in command of the USS Philadelphia, another 44-gun frigate that was coming into the Mediterranean to save Captain Edward Preble and save Constitution and finally give us the firepower we needed to end this war once and for all. So everyone is eagerly anticipating Bainbridge showing up. He gets into the Mediterranean. He gets off the coast of, of Tripoli, and what does he do to the Philadelphia? Runs her aground right at the most important part of the war. Very, very embarrassing for the United States Navy. Very embarrassing for Bainbridge's legacy. Very embarrassing for Preble. The rest of that story is that a young lieutenant on Preble's staff that you may have heard of, Stephen Decatur, was assigned to uh, conduct the first special ops raid. I've used that a couple of times where he... He surreptitiously went into Tripoli Harbor while the ship was pier side, getting work done by the Tripolitans. They were trying to resurrect it and use it for their own. And he boarded it under night and burned it to the ground so that they couldn't use it. So because of Stephen Decatur's heroism, he was then awarded the youngest captainship in United States Navy history and then later had command of USS Constitution. But the point is, Bainbridge screwed up. Bainbridge spent the rest of that war in a Tripolitan cell 
as well as the rest of his crew until the war was over and he came back to the United States. If a United States Navy captain in 2020 ran a ship aground, <laughs> I can assure you that they are not getting another chance. Okay? But in 1812, they did. So William Bainbridge shows up. You have Isaac Hull, who is the Tom Brady of the world, <laughs> coming off Constitution, and then this guy Bainbridge taking over for them. The crew was not happy. Okay? Uh, he was jinxed, I guess you could say, uh, in their mind. But little did they know, he actually was a great mariner, a, a great seaman, and courage with the best of them. His orders were to go out, find a British ship, and pick a fight. So he's down south, he's off the coast of Brazil, and who does he see? He sees a ship, HMS Java. HMS Java, a little fatter, a little heavier. This is an equal fight. We should have, oh, uh, yeah. We were losing. We were losing big time. Okay, we should have lost. Bainbridge is standing by the wheel, barking out orders when a cannonball comes by, hits his leg, destroys his legs. He's wounded. He's injured. He doesn't go down. He doesn't give up. He has two sailors hold him up as he continues to bark orders out to the crew. The wheel is gone. There's no way to turn. If you don't have steering capability, you're pretty much dead in the water. And he knew that. So he had to come up with a way to continue to steer. So he ordered his men to line up all the way from the main deck all the way down to the wardroom. If you've ever been on the ship, that's where the uh, rudder is down there. And the, it had been all disconnected. The men grabbed the lines, and you're able to manually turn the rudder, an enormous piece of wood that turns the ship. And he was able to yell down commands while he was wounded to the sailors. And we, we like to tell the kids that it was a big game of telephone. Left full rudder, left full rudder, left full rudder, left full rudder. <laughs> Ingenious, but it worked. And guess what? We were able to turn. We were able to maintain the ability to steer, so much so that the J Java had no idea how incapacitated we were and kept approaching us into a position where we could then lob another round of uh, broadsides on them and take them out. We killed their captain, their second in command took, took over and decided that they were going to surrender. Okay? When, uh, when the second in command for uh, Java boarded Constitution, he realizes how much of a mistake he had just made that they should have won. So I like to say that Captain William Braybridge showed the bravery, the character, the determination, and, and the uh, courage, that, which is why he deserves to be celebrated and is celebrated. The United States Navy had several ships named after him. But, but most importantly, on this day, December 29th, 1812, he regained the trust, confidence, and respect of his sailors. So... That's Bainbridge. Next. Looking at the clock here, let's say I could go on and on forever. The last significant battle of the War of 1812 for Constitution was this captain right here, Captain Charles Stewart. So now the name Constitution is really getting around the world. And the British Admiralty is saying, okay, not only are they a formidable force, they're better than us, and I don't want another ship captain taking on Constitution one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't have strength to versus Constitution, you run away. So on February 20th, 1815, HMS Cyan and HMS Levant are together. They're smaller than Constitution, but their combined firepower is more than us, and they decided to take us on two-on-one. -on -one. Charles Stewart, ready for the fight. He does a maneuver. It's kind of hard to explain uh, with, with everybody here. But one thing you don't want to do if you're a sailor, one thing you don't want to do is backwind, and that's where you take wind off the bow. You want the wind to come off your stern and push those sails forward. The masts are designed to lean back and then get pushed forward. If you put too much wind on the bow and push those masts back, you risk damaging your own ship. It's a tactic that no sailor in their right mind would do by choice. In this particular case, Charles Stewart did exactly that. 
he, he, he's, he's making a wide turn. He's got these two ships on his tail, and he basically slams the brakes, puts the wind off the bow as the other two ships fly by. He's able to conduct a broadsides on both sides. I just did that in 10 seconds. It probably took more like 25 minutes to happen. But in that uh, type of tactics, that's extremely fast, and we, we were able to win. Uh, funny story about Sion and Levant. Uh, the Treaty of Ghent that signified the end of the War of 1812 actually had been signed a week before. So <laughs> technically the war was already over, but because of a time late clause in the treaty, we were able to keep the Sion Levant as a prize. Did anyone read the Boston Globe a couple weeks ago? No? U.S.'s Constitution was front page news. Uh, not for anything we've done recently, but because of a story from Sion Levant. Uh, particularly one of the sailors that was on board the ship. His name was David DeBias. He was eight years old. He was the youngest sailor in USS Constitution history and was a free African-American uh, who lived in Beacon Hill, whose parents enlisted into the United States Navy at the end of 1814, and he served on board Old Ironsides during that battle. I encourage everyone to talk about it. I could, I could talk for two or three slides about it, but that's all we really know about his history. Yeah, I do know that after the War of 1812, he, he uh, well, I don't want to end on a bummer for Cyan Levant. We captured the two ships. Yep. We sent them back out with the American crew. They end up getting recaptured by the British. Well, we <laughs> usually leave that part out. But D David Tobias was on the Levant when it got recaptured. He ended up rejoining the merchant fleet and having a long career uh, in the merchant fleet until the ship pulled into Mobile, Alabama. And that's the end of the story. He started walking back to the northeast, and we think that uh, he, he was taken for uh, a runaway. So, uh, but I encourage you to read that article, and uh, I'd be glad to answer any more questions offline if anyone has any. So that's the end of the, the War of 1812. Next slide, please. This works better with the uh, school kids, because they don't know the answer, but I'll ask you all, is she made of iron? She is not. There is no iron on her, this ship whatsoever. What is the secret then? Why are her sides so strong? Next slide, please. Live oak is an incredibly dense wood. One and a half times more dense. It's, I think it's the fourth strongest wood in North America and in the top ten in the world. No one was using live oak for ships. It's, you can't bend it. It's just too tough and too strong. Until Joshua Humphreys, who was commissioned by Washington and the, the Navy, to design the first original, six original frigates, said, I'm using live oak. I'm going to do something different. Now, he was a genius, and he was able to design the ship that used live oak. The weight went up, but he contoured the bow so that we didn't lose any speed. That also included a much taller rigging, uh, so they were able to get back to about 13 knots max speed, but with able, able to withstand uh, the, the gunfire that we were going to take, the... the, the uh, the impacts that we were going to take. The iron that we, excuse me, the, the wood that was used for USS Constitution, the live oak in particular, came from St. Simon's Island in Georgia. And another reason you don't use live oak is because it's incredibly hard to harvest. Trying to get a thousand trees from Georgia up to Boston, Massachusetts was incredibly difficult. Many men perished during this time. Not happy to say that a lot of the labor that went into harvesting these trees was slave labor to get it up to, to Massachusetts. Uh, very difficult to use, but in the end, worth it. The outer section of the hull, this is hard to see, I think, but the center section, vertical pikes or live oak, you can't get through there. I could take a blowtorch to that and it's not going to light. On the outer side, soft white oak. White oak's pretty plentiful. Uh, a lot of the white oak we got for Constitution, which first original built, was from Maine. Uh, we actually have a forest of trees in Crane, Indiana, right now, on a U.S. Navy base des designated for use by USS Constitution. Live oak's very difficult to find, and we actually use private donations, trees that have fell on someone's private land. They donate to the United States Navy, and we use that. Um, so, white oak and live oak. Next. One of the other design features that... Joshua Humphreys put into effect that no one else was using, but it's the use of diagonal riders. If you know, if you're thinking about a ship being built, a wooden ship, you can kind of, you can see the ribs, you know, you picture the ribs. Joshua Humphreys decided, well, we need, we need more ribs. We need more uh, 
uh, structure underneath the keel to, oh, excuse me, underneath the main deck to support the weight of the gun deck. Uh, so we had to come up with another system of, of, of internal ribs that were at a diagonal, which were able to hold the weight of all the 44 guns that we were going to bring and channel that weight all the way down to the strongest part of the ship, which was the keel. So all that impact that you're taking on the side, that energy is channeled down to the ship, prevents hogging and sagging. No one was doing that. Next, please. I have a lot of 18, 19, and 20-year-old sailors who think Paul Revere is famous for providing the copper on USS Constitution and have never heard of a thing called the Midnight Ride. I guess they don't teach that <laughs> in school anymore. But that's all right. Paul Revere was instrumental in Constitutions being built. Uh, he provided the copper pins, the wood nails, and then later was really good at stealing the technology from the British about the copper plating and sheathing, which uh, technology that we still use today, to keep the wood that's under the water line protected, preserved. The 15% of USS Constitution that's original to the day, October 21st, 1797, is all under the water line. It's protected, being under the water line, protected from cannonballs, and also the sea, salt water, uh, great preserver of the wood, and that copper preserves it from uh, any of uh, natural uh, bugs and things like that. Next, please. Keep looking at the watch just to make sure I don't go too much. So uh, she's a, a square rig ship, which means when her sails are furled, she is square to the hull. Three masts, tall ship. She's about 221 feet at, at the tip-top point. I don't go up there. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. I have sailors that go up there. No thanks. I'll stay. I go up to the fighting tops. And that's about it, fighting tops being about right there. But I'll get to it. But the ship is, is functional. This ship will sail. The rigging is all intact, the running rigging, the standing rigging, three masts. We have six sails, vice the 48,000 square feet. They would have had in 1812, but, but uh, we still have a functioning rigging. 44-gun frigate. We have guns on the main deck we call carronades, we call, uh, the bashers. They fire a 32-pound cannonball. On the deck below, which you see right here on the gun deck, uh, 44, uh, well, excuse me, 24 pound long guns that fire that 24 pound ball, a uh, thousand yards. Next. The skills that the crew had then are still skills that we teach my crew now. We're not planning on firing anytime soon, but we go through the drills. It's basically an eight to 10 person choreographed dance to fire that ball. And you needed to fire that in about 90 seconds to two minutes. The British could do it in about two minutes. If we could fire in 90 seconds, that's more rounds per, per engagement. That means a better chance of victory for us. Another one of the advantages of being a six-ship Navy versus that thousand-ship Navy is we had resources to train with. We had spare powder and spare balls. Isaac Hull would take his crew out, and they'd run drills. The British didn't have time for that. Uh, while they're also fighting the French, they just didn't want to expel those resources on training. So we were able to get the, uh, the timing down to a minute and a half when the uh, French and the British were still about two to three minutes. I'm not going to bore you with this. This is, this is law, but you can thank Ted Kennedy uh, that uh, he put into law that USS Constitution would never leave Boston. So that's good news for us. It is American ship of state. It's not Boston ship of state. But she's a Boston girl, born and raised there. Very proud of that. Um, and this, this is the law that just says we're commissioned not for active service. Like I said, an active duty crew, but we're not really going anywhere anytime soon. Um, if, you, if you didn't know, where we are is not a Navy base. It's the Charlestown Navy Yard, which came in, into existence in 1800, built many warships, all the way up to 1974, when the Navy said, we're moving out. We're closing, and the Navy gave the Charlestown Navy Yard to the Department of the Interior, to the National Park Service. So that huge campus has now, over time, been siphoned off to private entities. The city of Boston, if you go down there, the buildings look the same, but all of it's privately run inside, repurposed, whatever, except for a small section by us, Pier 1, 2, and 3, and that is designated as a, as a national park. Which, uh, so we work closely with them. I'm going to talk about kind of what we do now. You know, we are kind of like a museum. Next slide. Um, we have uh, 
oh, this is funny. This is, this is a little joke. If you're in the military, you'll understand this. Uh, chains of command, communication. Back in the War of 1812, the chain of command was Secretary of the Navy reporting right to the CEO of the ship. Pretty simple. This is my chain of command. Next slide, please. A little bit different. Yeah, I have to report to all these people in some way, somehow. Makes things interesting. It's not what I expected when I got the job. But I love it. No, we, we work with lots of different commands from, from Kittery, Maine, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, all of the Boston Fire, Boston Police, Massachusetts Police, the city of Boston, the state of Massachusetts, all of these acronyms you don't know, but uh, Navy commands all over the country. I have some piece of, of USS Constitution that we have to report to. They don't fit nicely into anywhere, but it makes things interesting. Next. Uh, like I mentioned before, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to go long, I apologize, but uh, we just did a major restoration from 2015 to 2017. We're in the best shape of her life for the last couple of years already, and we won't go into another restoration for about 15 years. But she's had many. Every, every 15 years or so, she needed work. After every battle, she needed work. So that's why I say 15% original to 1797 is pretty good. And we're lucky that... The 85 active duty sailors that work for me, we come in two years, it's considered a special duty, and then we move. We move on, we go back to the gray ships, we go back out to sea. Uh, that's not good continuity or the expertise you need to really keep her moving. So luckily we have Naval History and Heritage Command, which is right there on the campus with us, and they are 30 expert carpenters, expert riggers, and they do all the heavy lifting, stuff that we're just not uh, prepared to do. So it's nice having them. Next, please. Uh, it's some pictures of uh, some sailors. We do some maintenance, uh, minor maintenance of things. We've been Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, you'll, you'll see see them working on the ship right now. We've we've taken down the foremast. We we have to do a lot of work. You know, it takes a lot of work and effort to keep that ship looking the way it does. The director and I joke that imagine this house having 600,000 people coming through each and every year and, and the repairs that it would need. You, you probably already have a significant maintenance budget as it is. It's, my house is uh, on Exchange Street. It was built in 1800. I have a significant uh, <laughs> debt that I have to pay to keep my house running. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad day. Two years ago, we had a, a, a eight-foot tide surge in Charlestown and then a king tide. The water was coming up over the pier and the relief valves go into the dry dock there. There's Constitution and ice. Knock on wood. The, the, the snow is over for, for this year. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, Boston's a challenging place to have a 220-year-old ship. Next. So why do we have 85 active duty sailors? Like I said, keep the story alive. Keep people interested. Try to stay relevant. Try to inspire the next group of United States Navy sailors. Try to encourage them to join us. So the sailors that I have, we go through a rigorous qualification process so that before I put them in front of the public, being the face of the Navy, and potentially and likely the only active duty person that most people will ever meet, they have to know what they're talking about. So we go through significant interpretation training, and we have a great relationship with the USS Constitution Museum, which is there on site with us. That is not a federal entity. It's a private, uh, private museum, and they're awesome, excellent people and know way more about Constitution history than I do, and they help make sure that our sailors know what they're, know what they're talking about. Next, please. Covered this. We're constantly training. Once the weather gets good, once it's consistently above 40 degrees, we'll be climbing. We'll be working on our skills to lower and set sail uh, to make sure that we're proficient enough to when we get that opportunity to sail her again uh, in the near future, we'll be able to. This is a tough job. I'm not going to lie to you. It's mm. tough up there. Uh, when I'm recruiting brand new sailors, I'm looking for a couple characteristics. Uh, certainly character <laughs> is number one, you know, being the face of the Navy. We need some solid people there uh, with the right, um, right behaviors. Uh, they have to enjoy, not be afraid of speaking in front of large audiences. Some of them never have. Think they can do it, can't do it. You have to love history. I've met way more 18, 19, and 20-year-olds that love history than I would have expected, uh, which is very, ha I'm happy to say, happy to hear. Um, but finally, truth be told, you got to be physically fit. When we drop this mainsail right here, this is about 2,000 pounds. That's going to take probably three hours. So you're on a one-quarter-inch tow line. 
100 feet in the air, putting all your weight on your belly and you're swinging. We won't go up if it's really windy, but all your weight's on your belly and using all arms, arm strength to raise and lower that flag, uh, raise that sail. That, that's, that's tough. That's tough. So physical fitness, something that's extremely important to be a Constitution sailor. How many women do you have on your team? We have uh, about 30 women. Oh, yes. Uh, the best. We, I have all women. No, I can't. 50, what, they're great. Some of your, your shorter women are really good at being out here on the, on the ends. <laughs> Very good. Fearless. I have fearless women. I have fearless men, too. But uh, no, we need, we need all shapes and sizes. Women tend to be a little bit shorter. They run the out of the yards. I have a, a sailor who's six foot five. We had to get him a custom built uniform. Uh, wow. But he's right in the middle because he's strong enough to help with the. As you start passing the sail in, it gets more difficult. And difficult. Lots of women. I'm proud to say we, that uh, uh, we're a very diverse crew representing the United States of America. Next. More pictures of sailing. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty good shot right there. I don't like it when they do that, but. Uh, so we, we, we're safe. Uh, once you're up in the yard arm, you're clipped on. But to get to the yard arm, you are not clipped on. You are free climbing. So that is, uh, that's pretty scary and why I don't like to do it all that much. Next slide. How many sailors were on it in 1812? About 450 sailors and about 50 Marines. And it would have been in battle. Everyone has their station. 200 men would work the sails, depending on what configuration you were in. Uh, and then 200 men would work the guns in the 8 to 10 man gun teams. And then some sailors would have you know, other positions. Everyone had battle positions. So 450 men is, is, is a lot. It seems like a big shift until you get on there and you get 450 people, which we have regularly. Uh, it's pretty cramped. And they were normally on a four-hour shift on and off. Yeah, I, I, I climb every once in a while if I, if I have to. Uh, that's me. When I look a lot older with my mustache. So who, who said that? <laughs> now I'm a fresh cut, clean. Uh, next, please. So 85 sailors, 450 sailors. Uh, not going to cut it if we're going to try to sail under our own power. So I, I need labor. I need sailors. And luckily, the CNO has said for two weeks every year, He's going to send 150 able-bodied sailors to me to say, make an attempt to sail, train them up on 18th century skills, and that's what we do. So besides the sail training, we teach them uh, pike training. We teach them the gun drills. Some of the, Why are we teaching gun drills? Like I said, it's, it's, it's a way to teach uh, teamwork in its simplest form, getting 8 to 10 men that have just met each other, work together. And, and the first time they do it, it takes them five minutes. Like, that's just not going to work. And over a week's time period of practicing, getting to know each other, yeah, you're, you're really talented this part. You do this. You're talented this part. You do this. And working together to figure it out, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of the reason why we spend the money to bring them there. Very worthy. Uh, next, please. What is the pike training? Pikes are uh, boarding spikes that you, you would use to repel the other boarders, or you would use them to make your way onto another ship. Ultimately, the two ships in battle are going to collide into each other, and, and that's really the way to end it. One, one is going to get on the other. Uh, we, we, we run them through uh, kind of like your sword, sword drill now. Next, please. That's Heritage Weeks, what I just talked about. Next, please. We're all out in the community. We're everywhere. I have sailors in Tucson, Arizona right now. We're going to 13 different cities throughout the United States in 2020, and then we'll do another 13 next year. The Navy spends a lot of... You've heard of Fleet Weeks. They do one in Boston, New York City, big ones. C cities that have a naval presence are on the water, but there's a lot of the country, obviously, that's landlocked that doesn't know a lot about the Navy, and we're trying to change that. So we send sailors to cities everywhere to talk about the Navy, why you should join the Navy, what the Navy's doing, and you can meet a United States sailor. So that's part of our mission as well. Get out into the community. Next, please. Mayflower being the first of 2020. The last two years, we've done seven. Uh, we've done a couple with the Vietnam War commemoration, an organization the DOD is sponsoring to recognize the 
uh, veterans of the Vietnam War that didn't get the thank you that they deserved back then try to make amends for that now that we're in the 50th anniversary window. We're celebrating that over five, five years. So my first underway in 2018, we had 400 Vietnam veterans on board just for the ride, just to have a great time. And we've done that each of the last two years, and we're going to do that again in June of this year. That's what we're here for. Take it out, show people a good time, inspire them, and uh, it's a good day. Thanks. Navy Weeks, I just talked about. That's us traveling to different schools. Uh, we try to get them young. You know, the high schooler is not as interested as, as elementary school kids. They really eat it up, really love it. Uh, well, at any age, though, it's never too early to try to inspire someone to love history, not even just naval history, but just love history. Next. Yep, we're everywhere. <laughs> Next, please. I do things like this. My sailors do things like this everywhere. We go to schools. We give presentations. Uh, the ship is open 300 days a year for tours. We also open the ship to special events, retirements, commissionings, uh, any type of ceremony you can think of. Oh, yes. The last couple of years. Oh, that's my favorite. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've had naturalization ceremonies on board the ship during Fourth of July week. We've had a USS Constitution sailor get sworn in on board the decks. One of the proudest things I've done. Uh, really cool. Look for that this year. Open to the public. Uh, we'll do that on July 2nd. I have two sailors, uh, one from uh, Ecuador and one from Haiti that are, that are not American citizens yet, but will be on July 2nd. Very cool. I'm behind Commander Schick, but I got to bring uh, a lantern up to the steeple of the Old North Church, a la Paul Revere, back last year. You can't see me, unfortunately, <laughs> but I was there. Uh, we, do, we do everything. We represent the United States Navy in Boston. Next. Parades. Do lots of those. You get to go to a lot of Red Sox games. That's not bad, <laughs> Benny, of being uh, on a Constitution, Celtics games. Education is one of our primary missions. That's what we're here. Next. That's Vice President Pence. We met him. He came to Boston last year. That's the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, the senior enlisted uh, in the Navy. I have four stars, three stars, every... Famous person you could think of come to us. That's a cool shot of an overhead of the Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, we're hoping to see some, some changes in the next few years uh, to enhance the experience. There's so much his great history of the Charlestown Navy Yard, particularly it's, a, it's more of a World War II story when 55,000 uh, Bostonians were building Fletcher-class destroyers like this, and a significant part of our, our, our commerce, Boston's, uh, commerce came through the Charleston Navy Yard up through 1974 when they shut down. Um, right now, people are coming to see us and want them to see us, but we have great partners with the National Park Service. And how can we tell the, the rest of the Navy story besides Constitution? And we're trying to, to turn that old, decrepit building that's right next to me uh, into, a, into the new Constitution Museum. What they don't tell you when you get the job is along with the 222-year-old ship, you get a couple of 215-year-old buildings that I'm responsible for maintaining and, and having sailors live in, uh, which, is, which is a challenge. That's our building right there. Uh, but it makes it fun. Next, please. That's a vision of the future. If you go down, it doesn't look like that right now. Uh, that building is, like I said, a, a rat hotel. Uh, but uh, we're hoping that's what's going to happen in the next 15 years. So I, I was hoping to keep it under an hour. I'm an hour, seven minutes, but I don't have to go anywhere if anyone has any questions. That's the end of the formal presentation.